Welcome back to another GTN Coaches Corner. I'm here to answer all your question on this week's show, how to train for a vertical kilometer. It's a bit of a niche one. How to make up for missed training close to race day. Uh, does the 10% rule work for mileage and intensity? Why it's harder to stay in zone three outdoors than it is indoors? And how to pace a race that has a particularly heady section. Right, straight into our first question, but before we do remember, you can ask your own questions in the comment section down below this video or any of our GTN videos. Use the hashtag GTN Coaches Corner, and we could be answering your questions next week. First question is from Callum Notman, and he says, hashtag GTN Coaches Corner. Hi guys, thanks for the great content. I've got my first ever vertical kilometer race mid-June in the Pyrenees. My running club often train for long trail races, but really something this steep over such a small distance. It'll be a thousand meters plus over one kilometer, four kilometer distance. Any tips on how to train for this, please? Well, uh, that is an interesting challenge. Uh, hills need to become your friend, basically. You need to be very comfortable running uphill, but also understand that you won't only be running uphill with that kind of steepness. Uh, you're gonna be doing a lot of kind of power work, which is kind of steps and uh, you know hill repeats where you are really using your glutes and your quads to force you up that hill. Uh, it's not just running. So you, a lot of your running that you're gonna do for aerobic fitness is great, but it's not gonna translate very well to that vertical kilometer. What you're gonna need to do is either run hills, and when I say run hills, I mean do hill repeats where you're running up fairly high intensity and then turning around and running back down. If you don't have hills near you or really steep hills uh, near you, then you can simulate this uh, stairs can be your friend, running up some stairs would definitely help uh, to use those particular muscles. And then also I'd suggest you definitely get into the gym, do some squats, uh, some deadlifts, that kind of thing, uh, that are even lunges that are really gonna work those muscles that you're gonna need to get up a vertical kilometer because uh, that's where it's gonna hurt. It's gonna be mostly muscular. Uh, it's an interesting challenge for sure. I. Uh, Calf raises maybe, uh, yeah, anything that's, that you're really gonna use that force. Uh, box jumps might, might be helpful, uh, but yeah, stairs and hills are your friend. I would probably put in two sessions a week where you're doing that, uh, and then the rest of the time, just get that aerobic fitness up, uh, because no matter how you get up it, aerobically it's gonna hurt. Your heart rate's gonna be really high. Okay, next one, Odasha KB says, hashtag GTN Coaches Corner. I was training for Ironman 70.3 Morrow Bay, California. There are six weeks left and unfortunately I caught COVID. I'll probably lose a week minimum and might take another week to recover, but I'm not sure what's the recommended next step. I was following a 16 week plan. I've lost 10 days of training in a previous flu, but I caught up those initial weeks of the plan. From that, however, I caught up, uh, but now I have this curveball. I have some key brick sessions coming up in three to four weeks. At what point? Should I give up hope on that 70.3 or is it still within reach? For context, my last 70.3 took seven hours, 25 minutes. So I'm in your bottom 10 percentile and I'm just looking to complete right. When it comes to coming back from illness, the first thing is to make sure you are fully recovered before you start again. It may be tempting to just you know push on and get out there as quickly as possible as soon as you feel like you're up and can walk around. Uh, that's a mistake. It'll almost certainly set you back. You'll be back in bed for another couple of days and you'll lose even more time. So make sure you're fully recovered before you start again. And then don't try and jump straight back into the training program, either what was set or even where you were before. You simply cannot make up what you lost and you also cannot jump straight back into the program where it was. It's gonna take you a few days to build back up, uh, listen to your body and get back to that program as quickly as you can. If you do have to sacrifice a few sessions, if you do have to sacrifice a few of those last sessions that um, and bring them back a little bit, maybe do 75% of them or so, you won't lose as much as you think you are. That fitness will come back, it is still there. If you've done a good 16 week training program and you're getting to the final stages, your fitness is there. It's not gonna just disappear with 10 days of illness. Uh, it will feel like it's disappeared when you start again, but it is still there, so give it time to come back, give it your body time to feel good again, and you may find that you're actually absolutely fine on race day. You would have lost a little bit, maybe three or four percent of your final performance, uh, but you certainly haven't lost your race day entirely. So don't give up hope, get back to training, get back to moving, uh, and you'll find that by race day you actually feel okay, especially with six weeks to go. I think you'll be, you'll be okay, you'll get through it. You obviously have the experience this time too, so don't stress too much, but also don't force it, don't rush back to training and don't try and make up lost sessions. It is what it is, unfortunately. Okay, next one is from Really87. Really87? Is mileage connected to the 
to all the running workouts, long runs, intervals, hill repeats. Does this affect how you adjust your workouts with the 10% rule? Uh, okay, 10% rule, basically, you should never increase your mileage week on week by more than 10%, otherwise you risk injury, burnout, illness, etc. It's just a kind of rule of thumb to make sure you're not overreaching and straining your body too much, giving it time to adapt. Uh, as for your mileage, yes, it includes all of those things. Any running you do counts towards your mileage. And when we talk about the 10% rule, it is generally spoken about as in 10% mileage, but what they actually mean is 10% overall vo volume or load, training load. And if you're increasing intensity, you're increasing your training load, even if you do exactly the same mileage. And if you increase your mileage, but you don't increase the intensity at all, then obviously you're increasing the mileage, you are increasing the training load. 10% is the rule for training load. Therefore, if you add a whole bunch of intensity, you are definitely going to be doing more than 10% increase in your training load. So bear that in mind. Don't increase your training load week on week by more than 10%, and you'll be okay. If you increase your intensity, don't increase the mileage. If you increase your mileage, don't increase the intensity or increase your mileage and intensity just by a little bit at a time and you'll be okay. Uh, yeah, they both they both work together. Your, your intensity definitely affects that training load and the 10% mileage rule should probably be rephrased the 10% training load rule. Okay, Martin P says, GTN Coaches Corner. Hi, GTN, another question about the zones. When riding on the trainer, I can hold pretty easily the upper end of zone three and I keep up my nutrition, but when riding outside, it feels a lot harder to just to keep in the middle of zone three, and I can't keep my nutrition and bonk almost every time on my long rides. Any tips for riding outside? Okay, there are a lot of things to break down here. Firstly, riding outside is not the same as riding inside. Riding inside is supposed to simulate riding outside, but it doesn't, not perfectly anyway. You are in a stationary position, you are stable, you don't have to balance, you don't have to use any of those stabilizer muscles, uh, and you can really control that power a lot more easily. Therefore, staying in upper zone three is significantly easier indoors than it is outdoors. You can just follow that number. There's no distractions, there's no external factors, there's no vibrations coming off the road, uh, and obviously you don't have to use any of those stabilizer muscles. It's going to be harder outside. Um, so. Bear that in mind. Don't try and hit the same zones you hold inside, outside. Uh, it's great to do your high intensity work inside because it's safe and you don't have to worry about buses or traffic lights or speed bumps. Uh, but realize that that won't translate to holding exactly the same zone outside. As for your nutrition, obviously, if you can't fall over because you're on a stationary trainer, it's a lot easier to take your nutrition and it's a lot easier to drink and eat without worrying about toppling over. Outdoors, it's a lot harder to find a long straight section of road where there's no speed bumps, no traffic lights, no wind, and you can actually uh, eat and drink as you would. And therefore, because you're waiting for those moments and you're not just eating and drinking when you feel like it, it's a lot harder to get the right nutrition in. This takes some practice. It also takes some concentration. Uh, what you can do is set an alarm or a notification on your bike computer or your watch that tells you, right, 15 minutes has passed since you last ate or drank, you need to take something in because when you're distracted by all the stuff going on, you're like, oh, next time it feels comfortable or safe or I'm going uphill or I'm, I'm slowing down a little bit, I'll eat and drink. It might be 45 minutes before you do that and then it's too late. Uh, so you need to be conscious of it. You need to actually consciously remind yourself or have something remind you uh, to eat and drink. And then you'll find it a little bit easier to maintain those zones. But as I say, you're never going to be able to hold the same zones outdoors as you do indoors. Just temper your expectations a little bit. Uh, having said that, the intensity, while your heart rate might not be as high, the overall load may be just as high at middle of zone three as it is at upper zone three uh, when you're indoors. So bear that in mind and make it specific to what you plan to hold on race day. Uh, and then Bethany, Bethany Blount asks us, Hashtag GTN Coaches Corner. For the third year, I'm planning to do a 10K trail race that is semi-flat and very runnable for the first half, but has short, steep hills for much of the second. Two of the hills are so steep, I consider them unrunnable with switchbacks on the downhills. I'm still trying to figure out the best pacing. What do you recommend for pacing this? What should or would I consider determine the best pacing strategy? As always, thanks for the help. Okay, um, Bethany. Sounds like a race of two halves. You're gonna to have to concentrate on the first half and maintaining a good rhythm and a good pace. And then the second half, you have to focus on getting up those hills. Uh, I would say that you want to run 
make the most of the runnable section in the beginning and, and really not lose any time, but you have to save some energy for that second half. Uh, my strategy would probably be to run at a comfortable, steady pace for the first 5Ks and then build in that you're going to walk on those uphills. Now, it may sound like you're just wasting time and they're really going slow, but you actually walking on a steep hill is more efficient than running. You will have a lower heart rate, you'll get up at not that much slower, and then you'll be able to run on the downhills. You'll have still have the energy uh, to run on the downhills. That would be my strategy. Save some energy for those hills. Uh, don't absolutely smash the first 5Ks because it's runnable and then not be able to get up those hills at all. You'll lose more time. Uh, so save some energy for those uphills and downhills. Remember, just because you're going slow, just because you're walking even, your heart rate is going to be really high and it's using that same energy zone. Uh, so you need to make sure you've saved some of that energy for that for that uh, second half of the run. Um, back end that run. So yeah, kind of build into it uh, so that you're really pushing your hardest only when you get to the hill uh, in the second half of the run. I hope that helps. Uh, let us know how your 10K goes. And for the rest of you, I hope these questions have helped you. If you have your own questions and we didn't answer something that's relevant to you, then as I said, leave them down below and we could be answering them next week. Thanks for watching. See you again next week.